Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, one of my father's dearest friends, Martin Sheen, will join us today. <laughs> Thank you. The Irish tell the story of a man who arrives at the gates of heaven and asks to be let in. St. Peter says, of course, just show us your scars. The man says, I have no scars. St. Peter says, what a pity. Was there nothing worth fighting for? I can't even imagine what St. Peter had to say when he saw Blaze standing at the gate a few weeks ago. And like Blaze, all of us are called to find something in our lives worth fighting for, something that unites the will of the Spirit with the work of the flesh, something that can lift up this nation and all its people to that place where the heart is without fear, where the head is held high and knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls where words come out from the depths of truth and tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sands of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action into that heaven of freedom, dear Father, let our country awake. Amen. Jim Lafferty without whom there would be no OOA. I've heard Blaise and Teresa say it several times, could not be with us. So it is uh, to me that I am doing the very modern high tech thing of reading his statement from the phone. And I will just say that every time Blaise's name is written here, as we all know, it is with the accent aigu. So it looks like blasé. I will be ignoring that. <laughs> this is from Jim Lafferty. Dearest Teresa and all of Blaze's family and many friends, we again find ourselves living in a dark time, a time of much hatred, a time of much cruelty, of much division and war. So when we gather to celebrate the lives of lost heroes, lost champions of great causes who never gave up and who accomplished great things, that is when we celebrate the life of someone like Blaise von Payne. It is the case, understandably, that we dwell in the main on the great things that our lost comrade accomplished. But since Blaze's death, I've been surprised at how much more time I've spent thinking about the character of the man himself. You see, given the more or less constant state of human crises, I find myself treasuring more and more not only what my dead friend accomplished, but what it was about him that made him such a special person, such a remarkable person, such a decent man. However, I fear that when I say Blaise Bonpain was simply one of the very nicest, kindest, loving people that I've ever called friend, I will be accused of offering too faint praise for such a great man. After all, some may say, Jim, there are lots of nice, kind, and loving people. Blaise Bonpain was so much more than that. Yes, of course, Blaise was so much more than that. But what made him so exceptional to me was who he was, as much as what he accomplished. You see, one of the most profound sentences I have ever read was written by George Eliot at the end of her novel, Middlemarch. Speaking of Dorothea, the book's heroine, she wrote, and I paraphrase, the fact that life goes as well as it does for you and for me is at least half owing to those who led quiet, quiet lives and lie in unvisited tombs. Now, Eliot was not disparaging those who in their lives did great things, as Blaze did, only recognizing that given the often sad state of human behavior, 
the often seemingly small, unheralded acts of love and kindness by the person go uncelebrated, but in the end, they mean as much or more to us as did their acts of greatness. It's been my privilege to know and to work with some of the truly great men and women of my times, men and women who, like Blaise Bonpain, wrote great books, led great movements, made inspiring speeches, and showed great courage in the face of personal peril. I'm talking about the champions like Blaise, who stood tall against the enemies of the human race, the great leaders of peace and social justice movements, and of the racial, gender, equality, and environmental movements. Yes, Blaise Bonpain was clearly one of those great champions, but can I say it? He was much more than, than these other things. He was quite simply the nicest one of the bunch. <laughs> I also believe that it was Blaise's exceptionally loving character that made him one of the least sectarian political activists I've ever known. Blaise understood and behaved as one who understood that now as ever, without maximum unity in our progressive movements, we are lost. I rarely heard an unkind word from Blaise about a progressive group or person with whom he had political differences. If they were in the progressive movement, they were all his brothers and sisters to be loved and cherished and supported. Blaze and I would sometimes tease one another over our religious differences. Blaze was a deeply religious man, whereas I'm a heathen, a non-believer, an atheist. So if Blaze were with us today, I suspect he'd be quite shocked and also bemused by what I am about to say, because ever since his death, I've had the craziest idea floating about in my head. I've thought, Blaze was such a great man, but also such a good man, such a profoundly decent, kind, and loving person that if I, an atheist, could quickly create a new religion for all to join who are spiritual believers and non-believers alike, the first holy man of that new religion would be Blaise Bonpain. <laughs> and then, whenever we'd say, Blaise Bonpain presente, his great spirit would be forever marching right along beside us again. Thank you. Jim Lafferty. Thank you. And Frank Dorrell, are you here with us? Yes. All right. Hi, Teresa. Hi, everybody. Emily's going to read my statement today. I came down with a case of Bell's palsy last week. I can't speak right. But um, before, I hand it over to Emily. Love you, Teresa, and everybody here today, everybody we've heard. And I want to say, on a side, she just graduated for her master's degree from Cal State Northridge in communications and where Blaze taught. And she was the teaching assistant for Reverend James Lawson this last semester. Emily Dorrell. Right. Thank you, thank you. Dear Teresa, Colleen, Blaze Martin, family, friends, and everyone here today, I loved and respected Blaze so very much. He was one of the most important truth tellers in this country, revealing the terrible horrors of the US foreign policy. At the same time, he was such a wonderful, loving, caring, kind person to everyone. I discovered KPFK around 1980, first listening to Alan Watts. Then I heard Noam Chomsky talking about US-supported death squads in El Salvador. After that, I started listening to KPFK all the time. <laughs> Soon, I discovered Blaze live on the station. From that time on, Blaze became my teacher, my mentor, my hero, and some years later, my friend, and a friend to my family. 
As I became more and more involved in the anti-war movement, I met Blaze and Teresa at many events. When I began putting on events myself, I would frequently host Blaze and Teresa. I would always refer to them as the heart and the soul of the anti-war peace and justice movement. <laughs> Through Blaze and Teresa, I met many important anti-war activists, including most of today's previous speakers and some who have since passed away, such as Don White, <laughs> Howard Zinn, Jim Horwitz, Eris Anagnos, and only two weeks after Blaze passed, Henry Howard. Presente Henry. Presente to them one and all. Blaze supported everything I did. He endorsed and supported the book I publish and distribute, Addicted to War. He also supported the two anti-war films I've been involved with. Blaze and Teresa were also very supportive when my wife, Jane, was in the hospital with cancer in 2012. Blaze always said that the truth is not negative. He spoke the truth on his important KPFK program, World Focus, and whenever he spoke in public. I will always remember what Blaze said about why he did his anti-war work. To, to try to stop his country, the United States, from killing millions of innocent people all over the world. Who knows how many thousands, if not millions of people, Blaze influenced over the years as he worked tirelessly in doing this important work. Dear Teresa, thank you so much. Blaze always said that he couldn't have done this work without you. What a great team you were. Thank you, Blaze. We will always remember you and have you in our hearts and our minds. I have the pleasure of introducing someone. My father chose to put a picture of, of himself with Alex Sanchez, who is here today, and I'm so happy to have you. It is an honor to be here today. Um, I first met Blaze in an event that I was invited to by Magdalena Rosavila, who had started um, Homies Unidos in El Salvador in 1996. So I went on to this meeting uh, that uh, one of our board members and also works with, with the Office of the Americas, Patty Wagonhurst. We were in her home, and, um, and without notice, Magdaleno asked me to speak. And I didn't have a choice because it was a fundraiser, and it was to raise funds for this program to help gang members reenter society in, in El Salvador. So I went and got up and spoke, and as I was speaking, I started to cry. And I started to just speak truth about the pain, about being in gangs, about not finding your way. And I remember Blaze came over, hugged me, Teresa hugged me. I felt, I felt it, I felt awkward in some ways because it was my first time in the house with white people, <laughs> right? So you can imagine all the other white people that have been in my life, my probation officer, my parole officer, the judge, the prosecutor, the prison guard, right? Even the deported officer. So I had, you know, mental blocks around white people. And I didn't know Blaze at the time. I didn't know what the work that, was, that, that he was doing, but I learned, and I just couldn't believe that there will be people that will risk their lives to help people like me. And, and I took that on, 
I said, if there's, if there's other people doing work like this to help people like me, why am I not doing this for my own people? And that's how I took on to start the chapter of Homies Unidos in Los Angeles. <laughs> Patty Wagonhurst is still on our board. She wants to leave, but she, we don't let her. <laughs> Teresa was able to leave. <laughs> but I think that, that the struggles that people fight for, no matter how big they are, no matter how small they are, it means something to people. It impacts society overall. And the legacy, I think, that Blaze is leaving here today is that young people like us should be given the baton to take this on. We need to take the responsibility and the leadership that they left us behind and continue the struggle for social change like I learned from Blaze, not just in our community, not just in our city, not just in our county, our state, the U.S., but around the world. Around the world, it's not just about us, it's about all of us or none. And I think that that's the legacy that I take from Blaze. I remember that after that meeting at Patty's home, you know, some of the uh, young women started doing house parties to raise funds for Homies Unidos. And one day I took a shirt and it said Homies Unidos, and they raffled my shirt off. I walked out of it without a shirt. <laughs> but this is how amazing, amazing the Office of the Americas is, and everybody that works in there. It's so amazing, Teresa. You know, it's, it's, it's this leadership that's created, you know, that, that really resonates throughout everybody else that works with it. You know, so it's been beautiful, beautiful having known all of you. And it's, it's, you know, I, I go back and to say there's, there's not many white people that I met before that I've really gotten fun to me, but, you know, I've been remembering Tom Hayden today as well, you know. <laughs> so my minutes are up, but, <laughs> but I just want to say thank you, Tom, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Blaze, thank you, Teresa. Our Salvadorian people owe you a lot. And on behalf of them, I am grateful for all the work you have done for our Central American people. And please continue, continue, because I'm part of that movement, and we're going to do whatever it takes to bring peace to our countries. Thank you. Our dear friend Larry wrote a song about my father, which is just awesome, and I have the pleasure of being able to play some percussion with him. I wrote this song 10 years ago for Blaze's 80th birthday, and I was inspired by the name Bon Payne, an unusual name. I don't know a great deal about romance languages, but I know that Bon always means good, and Payne is pane, and pane has got to be bread, so I called the song Good Bread, which is kind of appropriate for Blaze because as a priest he offered some good bread. And then afterwards he had plenty of nourishing stuff to offer us on the radio, at demonstrations, in jail, in his books. And of course as an Italian, anytime we would have a potluck he'd say, well I could bring some pasta. So here's some good bread for our good friend. That's what he gave us, good bread. And when he said, Hello, this is Blaise Bonpain for World Focus. He gave us some of that good, good bread. Born a Catholic, he heard the call to serve the church and the state. He did some time in the U.S. Marines 
and realized it wasn't too late to alter his course and dedicate himself to the Prince of Peace. Seminary ordination, the Mary Knowles made him a priest. Good bread, that's what he gave us, good bread. And when he said, do this in remembrance of me, he gave us some of that good, good bread, yeah. From Happy Jack to Way Way to Nango, liberation was a cool breeze. He did the, the kind of congregation and accompanied the least of these. And like Jesus in the temple, he overturned the table. Um, let me start this again. From Happy Jack to Way Way to Nango, Liberation was a cool breeze. He spoke the language of the congregation and accompanied the least of these. And like Jesus in the temple, he turned the table on hypocrisy, turning a silence about the compliance of the church with the military. Good bread, that's what he gave us, good bread. And when he said, Making is never passive. He gave us some of that good, good bread, yeah. He took off his collar, picked up his cross, a gorilla of peace, banishing darkness with blazing truth and brotherly love till he met Teresa Killeen, an ex nun, and a married old. They shared politics and a bed. I don't know about the order of things, but pretty soon the two were wet. Good bread, that's what he gave us, good bread. And when he said, for richer, for poorer, to love and to cherish, he gave her some of that good, good bread. Demonstrating, getting arrested, turning, speaking truth on KPFK. Teaching, writing, organizing, chanting, and starting OOA con Wally George on TV, overturning tables and walking away. Calling soldiers to resist the war from Vietnam right down to today. Good bread, that's what he gave us, good bread. And when he said, we need a moral revolution, he gave us some of that good, good bread. Poor man of honor like his father before him. The gifts he got, he gave back in turn to his children, Colleen and Blaze Martin, in whose lives we can discern the vision of their grandfather, the joy and courage of Teresa and Blaze. The hope and faith that sustain us in darkness and the stuff that we're here to pray. Good bread, that's what he gave us, good bread. And when he said, <laughs> Sorry. I got it now, good bread, that's what he gave us, good bread. And when he said, this is Blaze Bond Payne with a comment. He gave us some of that good, good bread. One more good bread. That's what he gave us, good bread. And when he said, I got some pasta I can bring, he gave us some of that good, good bread. <laughs> For about... 15 years we've been singing as the Bluebirds. It's just an informal singing group and playing group, and Blaze loved it. That's where he brought the pasta. And uh, we're just going to, some of us, sing his favorite songs. And Blaze Martin's going to join us. I'm not going to say all our names, but Linda O'Brien was a Mary Knoll with Teresa. She's from Rochester, New York, my hometown. Tiago, Nicole... Blaze Dillingham, his nephew, Susie Dillingham, his wife, Tony. We've got Nina, Liz. Anyway, sing with us. You'll know these songs. Let the rafters ring. Mm -hmm. 